Glad to have you back. Analysts at Proche Nigeria have projected increased bank loans and advances, among other things, following banks' recapitalization. Presenting a book, Beyond Profit, how a Nigerian company built a culture of credibility in Lagos, Mr. Taslim Shitabe, Managing Editor, Chief Economist, Proche Nigeria, said banks will increase loans and advances, and this will result in uh, increased manufacturing outputs and Nigeria's gross domestic product will grow faster. The report adds that for those investing in equities and uh, in the equities market, they expect that those companies will do better. There will also be an increase in capital gain and there will therefore be an increase in dividends, which if households uh, had invested in equities, there will be higher uh, household welfare. Well, let's get talking. And I have him in the studio. He's the managing editor, chief economist of ProShare, Mr. Teslim. For more on this report and what it holds for the banking economy. Thank you so much. It's good to have you live in the studio. It's a pleasure being in the studio with you. Thank you very much. All right, Dad. Uh, according to the report, ProShare Banking Strength Report for 2023 uh, related uh, access score, Zenit Bank. Many of us were expecting these banks to make that list, of course. FBNH, Echo Bank, Transnational Incorporated. Can you provide further insights really into the metrics? for the class of 2024 and the revised methodology. Okay, um, thank you. One of the things I should quickly say is that um, we looked at the metrics that was used in 2013 by the industry, and we felt there was a bit of a problem. Hmm. It wasn't dynamic. So it came up with a number of banks that were termed fugas in those days. What that meant is that Permanently, for over a decade, we had Tier 1 being equal to Fugas. Who are the Fugas? We had the FBNH, we had the UBAs, we had Guarantee, we had Access Bank, and then we had Zenith Bank. Um, of course, ProShare, uh, in its own report, added an E to the Fugas, so it became Fugazi. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that included um, uh, Echo Bank Transnational Incorporated. Yeah. Yes, because they had similar uh, matrices. So... We decided that, look, you know what? We said, you know what? One of the things we need to do is to see whether we could broaden the metrics. That having a static metrics wasn't adequate mm. for a very dynamic environment. Mm -hmm. And that we expect that tier one banks should be dynamic equally. Yeah. So some banks will come in in some years and they should fall out in other years. Rather than just saying that, okay, in Nigeria, tier one banks are fugas. Supposing another bank comes up and is twice the size of any other banks who are considered fugas, yeah. what happens? <laughs> so we said, no, we will be monitoring it annually and we will have a series of metrics. Now, in the uh, 2024 report, what we did was take 14 different metrics. The original metrics we used was four. So in other words, over the last three years, we've added 10. And one thing I would like to say about this is that we decided that size is not enough. You could be big in size, but you may not necessarily be efficient, you may not necessarily be effective in operations. Mm. Um, and the consequences of this we saw in 2005, mm. during the uh, Soludo consolidation period, where we saw some big banks actually melt down because they couldn't stand the heat. So we said, okay, so we're going to go beyond just about the size. So total assets, yes, it's good, but you need to go beyond total assets. What about the cost of risk? Mm. What about the cost to income ratio to show an evidence of efficiency? So there are a lot of things that we decided to put into the melting pot. And that's how we came up with uh, the class of 2024. Mm. It sounds good because I'm looking at that, the evolution, asset size, deposit liability, selected indicators. Mm. We can't stay with just all of this. We needed to. And I think I really like that. And the report is now coming when the recapitalization exercise for banks covering 2024 to 2026, which is also uh, is getting momentum. How relevant is this for the banking industry and, of course, for the regulators? Okay, that, that's a lovely question. Um, first and foremost, like we said earlier, it goes beyond size. Recapitalization addresses the issue of size. Mm. So we're saying that, okay, assets will increase, uh, liabilities will increase. That's good enough. But are they optimally utilized? Mm. How well are you using your assets? How well are you using depositors' money? So this report sort of gauges the efficiency and effectiveness of banks in terms of their capital. And then it also goes ahead to project that if these banks use this capital appropriately, 
then we should begin to see some impact on the gross domestic product. Don't forget, the, the administration has said that it's looking at a $1, one trillion, trillion dollar economy, economy by 2030. Mm. And if you're going to have it... Is a, that achievable, really? Yes, yeah, certainly. Wow. Go ahead, please. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, there's, there's, there's the hard work that you put in. Okay. But there's also the clever work that you put in to do it. All right, clever. Yes, there's the hard work. You could do sweat work and do it. But there's other ways that you could do it. And you could achieve equally good results, you know, along that line. Um, I won't go into the details of that. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go into the details of that. But we feel that one of the things you need to do, of course, is to grow the size of your banks. Mm. Your banks need to be bigger. But we are saying that the banks also need to be strategic. So if I'm bigger, what am I supposed, what's the purpose of being big? Being big. Mm. So identify the purposes of being big. Mm. Let me give you a quick example. We've seen one of the banks in uh, the, uh, the Fugas, because we are going back to the past. Initially, the first two reports disrupted Fuga because new banks came in. However, in the 2024 class, we've gone back to Fugas. Those banks that were seen as tier one in 2013, in 2003 rather, uh, no, 2013, are also seen as the tier one class in 2024. Now, one major characteristic is that these banks are banks that are stepping outside with big aspirations, not only to operate within Nigeria, but outside, outside. Nigeria. Nigeria. And therefore, we're seeing three banks, three of those banks, at least joining the top 10 banks in Africa. Mm. We are therefore seeing about the six banks being in the top 20. And that's really where we need to go, right? So that's why I said, yes, it is possible. If you dream it and you can do the work, you'll achieve it. Mm. Sounds very good. Now let's look at the major trust of this report as it relates to achieving uh, sustainable financial institutions and a robust uh, Nigerian economy. We all know what happened when the sledgehammer came on Heritage Bank and that fear in the banking space. So talking about stability and sustainable uh, financial institution and a robust economy is very important. Now, one of the things that we, we take this um, assignment very seriously in ProShare. Oh, good. Yeah, and, and we try to draw the linkages between the financial services sector, the capital market, and the Nigerian economy. One thing I will say is that the recapitalization effort is coming at the right time. Mm. It's a step in the right direction, and it's a step that we support wholeheartedly. However, there's something I need to say. If you look at recapitalizations that have occurred in the 80s, 1980s, we did it in 88, 89, we did it in 99, um, 90, 1991, 92, we did it again just at the cusp of the universal banking era in 1999. There was no much correlation between the increase in the size of the equity of banks mm -hmm. and the growth of GDP. It was fairly flat. So there's really very little you could talk about. In, and because some people say, yes, banks have increased in size, so what? The so what got answered in 2005, during the Soludo era. Soludo era. Yeah, so the banks moved from 2 billion naira equity to 25 billion naira equity. Yeah. And we started seeing GDP begin to rise steadily yeah. for two decades. Our expectation is that something similar is happening now, right? So we're moving away from, if you're, if you're national, you're moving away from 25 billion to 200 billion. Mm. And if you are a bank with a, um, an intercontinental license, yeah, intercontinental global license. license, you're moving from 50 billion to 10 times that amount, That's 500, 500 billion, billion naira. Yes. Yeah, and of course, that effect is sort of tempered by the foreign exchange rate yeah. situation. Yeah. However, it still places us in very sound position to grow, to use these resources to grow the Nigerian economy mm. and expand and de-risk Nigerian banks. How? Because Nigerian banks now are evolved around the whole African continent. So even if... Anglophone West Africa has a challenge. Yeah. You're likely to see East Africa do better. You're likely to see, although South, South Africa is really weak, relatively weak now, but they are picking up. So we can see that risk is spread across the continent. So even if one segment of the continent is not doing well, we likely see another segment of the con uh, continent doing well. That helps banks manage their portfolio more effectively. It feeds into the stability you're talking about. These banks become more stable. And of course, big is beautiful.
Yeah, I agree with you. It is. It is beautiful. Risk management, you've touched on it, and it's key. It's critical uh, to sustainability of the banking system. And your report highlights the issues around assets, liability, and management. Talk to us about the need for banks to keep their eyes on the ELM. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I must say that I think every bank in Nigeria is very conscious of the importance of balancing their assets and their liabilities. However, I do want to say that um, it is important for us to say that there can be some elements of misalignment occasionally. And when this misalignment occurs, it does, it's not necessarily a bad thing. For instance, if I have funds that are 90-day funds and I can roll them over, and I'm sure that I can roll them over, I can give you a one-year credit. Because I have 90-day fund, true, but it is roll-overable. Okay. So we can roll it over into a one-year facility. Yeah. So the fact that, oh, I have an asset of one year, and then I have a liability of 90 days is not necessarily a bad thing. However, that disequilibrium needs to be managed dynamically. Mm. So it's about the level of expertise of bankers that is important. Their understanding, and we've seen the challenges this could cause in Signature Bank in the United States of America. We saw that with Republic Bank in the United States of America. It was that ALM challenge. The inability of translating liabilities into assets in a dynamic way. I think Nigerian banks have proven quite adept at achieving this, quite honestly. From what we've seen in the analysis we've done, they have been adept at this. And I don't think that there's any major problem in that area. However, there is a question we want to ask ourselves. If we increase the equity of banks, what do they do with the additional money? Don't forget, banks typically use other people's money. Exactly. They take, that, they take liabilities, deposits from people, yeah, and then they lend, they lend, it, lend it. it out. So now they're using their own money. So what do they do with it? How do they manage their own money? That challenge also occurred during the 2005 Soludo consolidation. So banks grew so big, they suddenly had a Goliath mentality and did not recognize that Davids could actually do, it, do, it. do, do a turn on them. Yeah. 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 And we saw, therefore, we saw situations subsequently under the um, Sanusi era where smaller, so-called smaller entities took over bigger, bigger ones. Hmm. Very, very interesting. And I'm looking at those monies from that bank. Many expect more of interventions from the bank. Maybe just one question a bit away. But many still expect more, let me say. But looking at the interest rates, looking at um, what we have with inflation, looking at what is happening, other economic issues, what's your outlook for Nigeria's banking industry? Well, you know, at, 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 like I said earlier, the first thing you're worried about is that do these guys have too much money? Would they be overcapitalized? rather than mm. undercapitalized. Now, the issue is over, under. They're under. both very... They're both bad things. Yeah. You have yeah. too much money or you so don't have enough money. You don't have enough. <laughs> so, but we're looking at it from this perspective, that the fact that they have additional equity and the fact that Nigeria as an economy has massive headroom to grow, yes. this new money will be feeding into longer-term projects. For us, it's about do the banks who are traditionally more short-term-minded are they the ones to monitor and manage these long-term funds? Mm. Or, because of the whole cost structure, are they going to create other entities that are more development-minded mm. and can therefore afford to invest money five years down the line, mm. ten years down the line? Yeah. Because that's the kind of money they're raising. Money that they can use, not necessarily for short-term transactions, okay, but for longer-term investments. Now, if I could fund a massive road project, yes through this additional fund, and I can toll that road projects for a period of maybe 25 years, I'll recover my money in 10 years. The next 15 years is pure profit. That opportunity now becomes available to us because we have huge amounts of money. Mm, mm, mm. So in the entire outlook, you think um, it's still looking fairly good? Talking about the stability now of the banks. I think the financial system is quite stable. However, it is important to note that um, researchers at Prusia believe that it is necessary for the CBN to engage in some amount of interventions where you have some smaller, soft institutions that need um, support. And I'll, I'll bring that to the point of what you said, Heritage Bank. Earlier you referred to Heritage Bank. Yes, so we don't want another Heritage Bank on our 
plate. So the smaller banks, some of which the CBN has taken under custodial guidance, these banks need to find a way of increasing their equity capital. It is either that they, on their own, enter into combinations that will enable them scale up, quickly scale up within a period of two years, quickly scale up their equity, or the best bet will be hopefully getting an arrangement where banks come together, but these banks are not strange bedfellows. Because the fear is that you could merge banks, but they're strange bedfellows, different cultures, different personalities, and you create a whole new monster. Yeah, yeah. So you want to avoid creating a whole new monster. So preferably, we'd want to see a situation where these banks, currently under custodial guidance of the CBN, come together, agree, develop a plan, and then scale up. And I'll tell you for free, we are aware that there are foreign investors keenly interested in the Nigerian financial sector yeah, yeah. because they believe that the economy can grow at a minimum of 7% per annum mm. over the next 10 years. They have confidence that the right policy measures being put in place will guarantee Nigeria competing with the likes of India and China in terms of domestic GDP growth. Mm. That sounds pretty good, and it's a good way to live it. I've been speaking with managing editor and chief economist at ProShare, uh, Mr. Teslim Shitabe. Thank you so much Thank you for, for coming me. on Business Nigeria. We appreciate this, and hope to see you again soon. Certainly. <laughs> Certainly. All right, then. Thank, Thank you so much. Well, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll move to discuss the power industry, the insistent greed collapse across the country, what's been happening